allow me to introduce myself again. So Eddie Toh, I'm from Intel. Uh, I manage the data center platform marketing team across the region. And uh, very happy to be here today. Thank you, uh, AWS, for the invite. And I must congratulate them for what looks like another successful AWS summit. Um, I hope you guys have a great conference. So today I want to talk about innovation. And let me start and dive in and start talking about Intel's own innovation. Um, last year was actually the 50th anniversary of Moore's Law. And for those of you who know Moore's Law, Gordon Moore, who's one of the founders of Intel, postulated Moore's Law way back in um, 1965. And then it was in 1965 that he said that, hey, every um, 18 months, two years, we will double the amount of um, transistors within the uh, CPU. Um, every two, and, and thereby bringing more economics to the uh, processor. Um, increasing processing capability in the same uh, energy envelope. So you can see here, and I'll read it out to you, it's a little bit small. In 1974, we started with the 8080 processor that only had 4,500 transistors. You move on to 1978, four years later, it's up to 30,000 transistors. Uh, fast forward to 1985 with the 386 processor. Um, it had 275,000 processors. And then if you go down from 85 to you know, the year 2000 with the Pentium 4 processor, 42 million transistors within a single CPU with the Pentium 4 in year 2000. And that occupied a space of 0.18 micron. Um, small, right? Don't you say um, And six years later, with the Core 2 dual processor, 291 million um, um, transistors within the processor, right? And last year, when we launched the Xeon D CPU, um, 4.3 billion transistors within the processor alone, right? In a 14 nanometer package. So lots of transistors within a CPU, uh, lots of processing capability increasing exponentially. Um, and we foresee, you know, although the analysts and a lot of analysts have predicted the death of Moore's Law, we at Intel, based on what we see from our engineering roadmap, we foresee more slow to continue for a few more years yet. So, um, and you know, the key thing beyond just our innovation and how much transistors we pack into a, into a CPU is the innovation that the industry has driven around the CPU. And you see it from calculators to mini computers um, to laptops today to high-end, high-performance computing systems to large data centers like, like AWS. Uh, powering things like the Space Shuttle, the International Space Station. Last year at the AWS Summit, we talked about the Mars rover uh, and the analytics being done there in the, in the AWS data centers, data from the Mars rover. So lots of innovation being driven on top of what we do with the CPU. Um, we've talked for a few years already about you know, the, the growth that's happening um, in the industry around data, data growth. Right? Craig just talked about big data. Uh, we talked about internet traffic uh, growing as well with things like Facebook, um, um, the increasing users doing online shopping on, AW, on Amazon, um, uh, Google searches, etc. And, and that's all going to continue to grow you know, over the next few years. And you can see some stats here by 2020 for more than 5 billion you know, people on the internet, uh, more than 50 billion connected devices, 44 zettabyte of internet traffic. I can't even explain how big that is. Right? But the key thing with all the growth is really the new business and usage models that, that it drives, that it enables. And Craig talked about some of the new innovative usage models in analytics that some organizations are deploying across the region. Um, and it's not just in, you know, he used an example in, in real estate and, um, uh, and uh, the, the Vietnam manufacturing company, but it's really spanning across the different uh, verticals in energy, retail, um, healthcare, healthcare is a big growth area for, for analytics and what you can do with personal medicine and, and doing um, really one-to-one -one targeted treatment for an individual patient and not you know, um, doing the same treatment for, for a patient who has cancer. They all go through the same treatment. Individual, one-to-one -one type, personal treatment uh, in healthcare. Okay? And the technology shift that's driving all this is really the changes in the infrastructure you see in the bottom. Right, the client continuum, client devices continue to get uh, smaller, better, faster. Uh, you know, we had laptops, we had smartphones, right? Uh, you know, iPhone, Android, Samsung, whatever. 
And then we have the Internet of Things. These are devices, and I think Craig talked about it a little bit as well. Um, the sensor network that's out there, the multitudes of surveillance cameras that's out there, these are the things that get connected to the Internet, that get connected to the cloud. Uh, and the data that's collected then needs to be analyzed. You know, that's, where, you know, that's what's driving big data. And without big data, without the anal analytics, the data we collect from the sensors are essentially um, you know, useless. Right? You need to do something with data, analyze it. Um, the growth in cloud, and of course, security is a, is a key um, pillar as well as we look to uh, building new infrastructure to enable the new business models that we, that we, uh, that we see coming. Um, the first stage of cloud growth has really been driven by the digital services economy. And what we mean by that are companies that are born run on the internet. Um, Amazon uh, for online shopping, uh, Craig talked about Uber, Airbnb, Grab Taxi. These are the um, um, companies born from the internet that is um, driving the first stage of cloud growth, right? Facebook is, is an example, tremendous growth in Facebook. And, and that's really you know, leading to a, it's creating a cycle, what we call a virtuous business and computing cycle whereby you know, as more services come on board, uh, we have more customers buying the new devices. Um, that's, you know, we had iPhones a couple of years ago, smartphones, people are now talking about wearables, smart watches, um, and lots of other smart devices. Right? So more devices will drive, will need to be connected to the data center, which is great for us in Intel, we love it. Um, and as more data centers collect the data, there's an ability to analyze the data and roll out new services. Right? And with new services, then it, someone smart will say, hey, I need to create a new device that can deliver this service in a better way. Right? And so, so forth. The virtual cycle will keep going. Right? So new services will drive the explosion of new devices, and new devices will drive demand for, for servers and data center, leading to more services again, and, and so forth. So we see that continue to grow. grow. The first phase is from consumer applications like you know, Facebook, uh, Amazon. But moving forward, we think a lot of enterprise, as, as the, they, they shift their workloads to cloud, we'll see a lot more enterprise applications come online to drive the next phase of cloud growth. Okay, so let's talk about um, you know, Intel and AWS and, what, and the innovation that's going on to accelerate this cloud adoption. Um, firstly, and you guys, you know, those of you who are work in enterprise IT, you know this already. That's various workloads that you need to cater for. Uh, they're all very complicated, and they all have different attributes. So on the x-axis, you can see that's the I.O. intensive axis and CPU memory intensive on the y-axis. So at the very top right, you have HPC type applications that are very I/O intensive. They require very low latency, uh, very lots of throughput, and very CPU intensive as well. Lots of uh, CPU processing capabilities are, are, are required. Uh, on the extreme um, left, on the on the bottom left, a dedicated hosting, not so I/O intensive, uh, not so CPU intensive. These are standard websites with you know information. Um, uh, you know, call who to contact, contact us, you know, not so CPU intensive or IO intensive. And then you have things like uh, cold storage. And cold storage would be something that uh, the Amazon Glacier service that Craig talked about, archival. And I'll give you an example of cold storage when it comes to um, your Facebook photos. Right, so if you've been on Facebook, if you've been online with Facebook for the last few years, you know you you get married, you have your wedding pictures. Everyone goes in and look at it. Right, you have a baby, you post your baby pictures. All your friends go in and look at your baby photos, uh, of, of the photo of your kid. Now, when your kid grows up to 10, 10 years old, no one looks at those photos anymore. Right, no one looks at your your wedding photos anymore. But Facebook still needs to make it available online. Right, and that's what cold storage is all about. The photos are still online. Um, they still sit in, in, in a part of the data center, like an Amazon Glacier, uh, for archival. And anytime someone, you have a new friend who wants to know what you look like 10 years ago when you got married, he'll go and look at those photos. So it's still online. It's not CPU intensive, sort of I.O. intensive, depending on when, you know, how much gets used. Um, but again, it's an example of another workload that you need to take care of in the cloud. Right? Um, graphics rendering, very CPU intensive, uh, big data. I/O intensive, somewhat CPU intensive, and so forth. So you get the picture there, right? So lots of different workloads. So what does that mean for Amazon then? If I want to be a for AWS, if I want to be a cloud provider for enterprise applications, I need to be able to navigate all the different workloads. I need to be able to cater for it. 
And if you look at the breadth of offering from you know, um, AWS just on EC2 alone, you can see that the, the different workloads, that the different instances that's, can, that's available in EC2 can cater for all the different workloads that's out there. Um, you know, R3 instance for, for memory optimized workload, you have the C4 compute instant. Uh, C4 compute optimized instance um, that's based on you know our version three uh, of the E5 processor that we launched last year, right? That's the, the latest and 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 fastest uh, instance from from EC2, and you have you know the T2 micro instance for the hosting workload, um, uh, M3 is the standard instance or the M4 instance when they upgrade the new CPU, and so forth. So. Different instances for different workloads, and I think based on what uh, AWS has done, the, the 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 thought process and the innovation that they have, uh, they've got an instance for whatever the enterprise workload that you have that you're considering to move to AWS. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Now, specifically on the CPU, I showed on the previous slide lots of different CPUs. And again, here it's another slide on, on the right hand side. So the C4 instance is based on E5 2666 CPU. Uh, it's actually a customized CPU that Intel builds for Facebook. Uh, the M4 instance uses a different CPU, similarly with D2 instance, different CPUs for different workloads or different instances. And what I'm showing on the right hand side of the slide are the features within the CPU that's being used by the instance. Now, why is that important for you? So for example, uh, in our CPUs, we have a feature called ASNI, uh, which is a security feature that the instruction set within ASNI accelerates uh, encryption and decryption of data, thereby ensuring that if you are running a security application that does encryption and decryption, you'll need that feature to be available on an instance. And if you go to the AWS website, you will find a listing of tables of the different instances and what uh, CPU features are available on an instance for your particular workload. Uh, you have things like Turbo Boost technology that's available on, on, on a lot of instances that, that will uh, enable more performing, more computing power, make it available to that instance when the application demands it or when there's a spike in the workload. And you have things like AW, uh, AVX 2.0, OK? So let me put, uh, try and put that into a real example for you guys. Craig talked about Netflix being a customer of Amazon. So Netflix, um, um, you know, smart engineers at Netflix, they actually optimize their uh, video delivery algorithm on, uh, on with our CPUs together by engineers uh, such that they can deliver good service to you. As an example, uh, Netflix made a commitment that they wanted to encrypt all their movie streams as they deliver the, 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 the movie to the end users. Right? And this is very important to them as they expand and, and their footprint into a global reach. They want to ensure that their content providers um, assure their content providers that their content is, is, is secure, will not be, you know, no one can steal the content. Right? So they want to encrypt their video streams. So they work with, with us, they, they, they optimize the algorithm, and they spend a lot of time using ASNI to optimize the algorithm. As a result of the optimization, with the version 3 CPU, the instances you see here, they're able to increase the encryption performance by 2.1 times, right? double from the previous generation. right? and thereby ensuring that they can now deliver um, a HD video stream encrypted to the consumer uh, with no degradation in performance. Right? So they meet their commitments around encrypting for their content providers, and they're able to meet their SLA to deliver a HD stream to you that you paid for um, um, uh, in, in, without any degradation in performance, right? Uh, so that is version uh, 2 to version 3. Now, we've recently launched version 4 of the CPU of the E5 2600 family, which Amazon will roll out soon. Um, and on version 4, Netflix again optimized it further with the new instruction set that we brought in. And they're able to increase the encryption performance by another 2.5 times from version 3. Right, thereby ensuring even better performance for their customers, for you guys when you sign up for a, when you buy a Netflix movie. Okay, so that's an example of how um, a, a company or, or a service provider uses the CPU features within Intel uh, to deliver great user experience to the consumers, to their customers. Okay, and it's something that we as customers don't see, but there's been a lot of work, a lot of time spent in the background to optimize. Uh, to ensure that, that the customer experience is, is optimized and that the performance um, is, is good. 
Okay? So that's the kind of innovation that Intel works does with the industry and what we do with, with our partners like AWS. Okay? So another example here. Um, um, and you know Novartis. I'll just talk about Novartis. So they're a pharmaceutical company. And if you look at the Amazon instance on free slide, there's lots of different instances, right? C4. When do I do I do C4 or do I do C3? Right? C3 is a little bit cheaper, obviously. But what they found was that when they pick the high performing instance, the highest instance that, we, that, that guarantees the, you know, the, the, the users the highest CPU from Intel with the highest frequency, they're able to save more. Even though they're paying upfront for a higher cost instance, they're able to save more money because they require less. Okay? And this particular example, they found that they could save up to 65% cost savings uh, over signing up for a lower cost instance. Right? And again, this is in a way driving the virtual cycle again. Right? So C4 customers today, uh, you know, when C5 instances are available, uh, they'll be going to a C5, right? Because they see that for the same money I spend, I can get more processing. Or I spend less and I save money for the same amount of processing. Okay? So that's how um, a, a AWS end user can benefit from using, you know, um, the, the Intel technologies that AWS has, has optimized or enabled within their instance. Okay? And uh, it continues. They've recently announced uh, a new instance called the X1 that provides for ton of, uh, a ton of memory uh, for that particular instance, up to 2 terabytes of memory and up to 100 virtual CPUs. Right? And this is designed for the most demanding enterprise workload. Again, enterprise customers, if you have a very demanding enterprise workload, you're thinking, should I put it on AWS? Well, they have an instance for you now that can cater for that. Okay, uh, things like SAP HANA, your SQL Server, your database servers, and this uses our highest-end E7 CPUs. Okay, so this is only available in the US uh, for now, but um, over time, I'm sure AWS will make it available worldwide to all their customers. Okay, um, <clears throat> and it's going to get better on AWS. I talked about uh, you know the fact that we've launched the version four family recently, so that was launched on 31st March. The X1 instance is based on the E7 v v3. We're launching v4 in in June uh, 2016, right? So it's going to get better as Intel continues to deliver on our promise to improve performance, improve energy efficiency in our platforms as we deliver the next generation of the cloud platform to our customers like AWS. Okay, let me switch gear and talk a little bit about um, analytics. And Craig has talked a lot about, well, Craig talked only about analytics just now. So I probably won't, uh, I won't spend too much time on these slides. But uh, we know this already, right? Uh, there are stats out there that say, that, hey, companies that do analytics uh, do better, right? Because they know what's going on. Um, they're able to make decisions faster, execute on decisions uh, better, um, et cetera, and, and deliver better financial results, right? Um, and with analytics, you get more insight, more competitive advantage, and you get measurable business value, right? If I'm implementing a cluster to do big data analytics, how do I know I'm getting value out of it, right? Um, and you know, Craig talked a lot about that already, but um, this is why analytics is key, and a lot of companies are, are embarking on that down that path. Okay, so. Um, just like with the cloud instances, um, a lot of our technologies are being used uh, by uh, AWS as, you know, as they, for all their analytics instances, right? Craig I talked about AMR. Uh, that's an example of scale-out analytics. Uh, he talked about the scale-out data warehouse, Amazon Redshift, uh, scale-up analytics. Uh, for things like in-memory computing, uh, even analytics at the edge, right? Werner talked about it in his keynote this morning as well, right? The Kinesis service, where we can we can take streaming data from um, IoT devices, gateways that's connected it, at the edge of the cloud, um, and use Kinesis to capture those data, and of course do something smart, things like analytics at the edge. So regardless of whatever is your um, analytics requirement, what you want to do, AWS has the capability to deliver it. And it's all built on top of Intel. And there's a lot more technology here, which I won't go into. OK. Um, OK, so to summarize, you know, I talked a little bit about Moore's Law. Um, you know, we think it's going to continue for a while yet. Um, and it's going to continue to be the driving force behind IT innovation, right? You know, Beyond just IT, you'll see um, you know things that's that's you know driverless car. That's not really IT, but a lot of it's going to rely on what we're able to deliver from a compute uh, performance capability, 
Okay, um, a cloud architecture is important because they'll allow you to be, you know, nimble, uh, deploy your your uh, uh, server resources quicker for your line of business. It's going to be critical for um, competitive advantage. And and lastly, uh, Intel and AWS, we've worked together for many years, for a long time, and we will continue to um, collaborate more and innovate and deliver best-in-class user experience for you, the the Amazon customers.